All right, let's go ahead and get started if we could. I appreciate those of you that come out on a cold and wet night. None of us picked this weather or would have wanted this weather, but there it is. I've had people say before, well, you've, you're used to cold weather in, in Scotland, and the answer to that is, and I moved. So it's, it's not like I liked it. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm going to move just a little closer, if that's all right, with my audio, audio fellow as well. Um, let's say a prayer, and then we'll get started. Our Father in heaven, this is your world, and we are your people. We pray that you would follow, uh, that we would follow you, that you would fill us with your spirit and give us wisdom as we talk about some of the most important aspects of our lives and our witness here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen. This is not going to be <clears throat> a series that's about me, but I need to start with something just to to really lay the groundwork for what we're talking about here. And that is, uh, my father is dying. He has dementia, and he is um, in a very bad state with the dementia. He's in that phase where he's very, very abusive, verbally abusive, accusing, um, paranoid, and it's gotten to the point where the facility where he is has told us yesterday when I went down, he needs to be moved to one which is a specialty unit because he, we can't control him. And I, we knew that was coming. Yeah, we did it. We're, we're, rather, we're, we're, ta- we're going to take care of that this next week. With that said, um, you need to know that my father has never been an exceptionally kind person to his family. Outside the family, people saw a lot of kindness. But in the family, there was a lot of abuse that went on. I've lost two sisters to suicide, uh, one uh, 12 years ago and one two years ago. That said, every week I drive the two and a half hours down to where he is. I take care of him. Even before we put him in the facility, I'd go to the assisted living center, took care of them, shopped for them, cleaned for them, changed his diaper and all the other. And I've had a lot of folks say, how can you do that? And it's actually, this is the point that I'm wanting to get to, to start us tonight. I do that because that's my job. It doesn't matter if he did his or not. It doesn't matter the way he treated us or not. I am a man under orders. I have a Lord, and that Lord gave me law. I am either a man under orders or I'm not. I'm either going to do my job or not. And I can't use other people's behavior and other people's choices as an excuse not to do my job. Now think about it this way. Some of you might have served in the military. You know that you might not feel like getting up in the morning when they tell you to, but you're going to. And you might not feel like jumping out of that airplane when they tell you to, but you're going to, or they're going to throw you out. It is all about once you have stepped across the line, if you're a Marine, uh, you you put your feet in yellow footprints at Paris Island, however it was that you did it, you determined that you were under orders, that you were going to be a person who understood the command structure and you were under orders. Now, here's the thing. I came from a very very harsh legalistic church. And it would have been easy for me then to go all the way over here to act like there is no rules at all. But that's not, we're not pendulums, we're people. We're supposed to be thinking. And there is law. I've been married now for 39 years. June will be 40 years. There are rules about how I'm to treat my wife. It is not about whether I feel like it or not. It's not even about whether she does her job or not. I'll let you figure out what that job might be. Because, again, that's not my determination. I'm not here where it's all law. I'm not here where there is no law. Instead, I'm a man who has Jesus as my friend and Savior, but also as my Lord. We have forgotten this. And because of this, if you are married to your first mate, your first spouse, and you, um, you have children, 
that are yours. You are now in the minority in America. We went from about 73% of the population to 48% of the population in the last 20 years, and it's dropping like a rock. I've had a lot of folk come to me and say, now we need to change our churches because we have a different target base. And I, I absolutely agree. We have to adjust because if, you're, if your church is wrapped around mom, dad, and the kids, you're, go, you're losing the ability to reach your population. However, I think we also need to talk to the people about why we chose to be mom, dad, and the kids. That there was a reason for this. And that there are benefits to this. So, Tonight, we're going to start by talking about the role of the man and the role of the woman. And I'm going to try hard not to be sexist about this. I really am. Because, and I might be. I might become sexist. You can always go, stop it. Seriously. I, I, t- uh, I have a church there in Asheville, and I tell people, I don't think I'm a racist, but if I say something that you think is, tell me. And I don't think I'm a sexist, but if I say something that makes you wonder, tell me. We have to sharpen up our language. We have to sharpen up the way we behave. And I'm fine with that. Uh, so let's, you know, you tell me when I've blown it, thank you. Uh, but I don't want to blow it. Uh, here we go. Mom, dad, and the kids wasn't something which God thought up just because he wanted to or to punish us. It's actually a very freeing thing. Now I want you to think about something for a moment. I have a beautiful wife. So a few of you have met her. Most of you have not. But you could, I mean, if you troll on Facebook, you could find her eventually. Um, she's a lovely lady. She is smart. Uh, she is artistic. She has um, uh, her, her own business in interior design. That's not an de- interior decorator. And I always have to stress that de- anybody can call yourself a decorator. But to be a designer... You have to have a certain level of college degree and then a whole bunch of professional testing like a CPA does or a lawyer does to have those letters after your name. Well, she has all of them, and she's at the very top. I I admire her. I respect her. um, I find her amazing, but she's very different than me. She came from a different kind of family life. She um, also, again, is artistic. I am not. She has different ideas than I have. I've never even asked her how she's voted because that's not what we're together for. My job is to love that woman. Her job is to love me. And so far, it's going pretty well because we follow these rules. What we're going to do is we're going to start with a chapter which has been misused a lot, and that's Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to show you how you can read the Scripture with whatever version you've got, And not know Greek and can still get out of it what you need to get out of it. Far too many of us, if we were to say, I'm going to read Ephesians 5, which is where we're going. You would sit and you would read Ephesians 5 and you would say, I am now done reading Ephesians 5. Don't do that. The Bible wants you to learn how to meditate. And we don't talk about meditation because we've gotten, um, the word has gotten to be a bit misused or at least applied um, in a, in a one-sided way. Eastern meditation, which is what most people think of when you say meditation, means to empty your mind. The in, uh, meditation in Scripture means to empty your mind except for one thing. To murmur is what the word means. To murmur repeatedly. To get one thing in your head and to really work it in your head. That's what we're going to show you how to do by by taking care to pay attention to what is in front of you. In Ephesians chapter 5, most people, when they run to this to talk about the family, start with verse 22. Let's remember something, though. If you didn't know this, it's time that you did. The Bible was not originally written with chapters and verses. It was uh, written and said, oh, oh. late breaking news, is it? Oh, okay. It's never rigid. Well, God wants you to pay attention, evidently, to uh, the, the, um, we'll find a third grader. They can fix this. There we are. It's all right. It's fine. 
all of us, all of us have hit the wrong button sometime. Uh, when you, <laughs> when you take a look at this, I want you to to remember that the Bible was not divided into chapters and verses. It was, and in fact, I, I really feel that was somewhat of a tragedy. Because when, uh, when you read the Bible without chapters and verses, and there are Bibles you can buy now without them, it makes more sense. You see a flow of a story. You see the rise and fall of kingdoms, and you see all kinds of things you don't see when there are chapters and verses, because chapters and verses chop everything up. And we go and we, we read a chopped out little section. Uh, and there's no context to it. And just remember that a text without a context is a pretext. You, you, you have to have your context and know what's going on. In Ephesus, there were men that were um, not taking over the role of husband, but rather just doing whatever they were told and trying to survive because Ephesus was run by a religious cult that uh, Diana... Was the, was the goddess, and the women got to rule the roost. But when they ruled the roost, there was a, a lot of disorder. And I get this every so often. Somebody will say, well, if women ran the nation, we wouldn't have any more wars. And that's ridiculous. You'd have wars all the time. You just wouldn't know why you're having them. Because you're supposed to know, but no one will tell you. It's kind of like England saw France looking at Germany that way, so they're going. They're in. You know, um, it's, there is no one sex which is better than the other. That's not the way this works. All right? So I say all that because when people go down chapter 5 and they start at verse 22, wives, submit your, yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, women get very offended and I always pull back and say, look at the verse ahead of it. Submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. Submission is not a female obligation. It is a Christian obligation. Male and female. Submit. I do lots of things I would not do if I were not married to Cammy. I have furniture I would not have bought. And I, I, it's quality, and it's nice, but I'm just not sure why it's there. There is, for the longest time in our, in our house, we're in a different house now, a room called a living room in which no living was allowed to be done. You couldn't, you know, I'd walk in it every now and then and go, whoa, what, we have a piano, you know, and I was told to leave the room. You know, everything was nice and such. I would, there are places, there are movies I would not see without her. There is music I would not have heard. She brings in another perspective. And I go and submit to her to allow her to enjoy. And I don't sit there and go, ah. She was a figure skater for over 30 years before she uh, took some real damage and had to stop about six years ago. Um, I don't really care for figure skating. But whenever there's a show coming into town with it, whenever they're doing, I buy tickets, I take her. And I enjoy it because, not the skating, I enjoy that I'm able to treat her. I am submitting to her. She submits to me. There are times that I, I'm playing a guitar here, there, or the other. Or, like tonight, where she ate alone because her husband was on the road. She gave up part of her life so that I could do what I do. That's the way it works. Mutual submission. And by the way, that only works if you don't keep score. If you keep score, you're not submitting, you're competing. That's a big difference. But I'm going to tell you that even if you start in verse 22 of chapter 5, we can work with this. Let's do it. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. And here's where we stop and we remind you, that the Bible was written for us, but it was not written to us. Therefore, the language, we have to watch what the language is and what it is saying to the people that hear it. If you were to talk to the people in Ephesus and say, give me a synonym for the word head, they wouldn't come up with words that you and I do. 
if I ask you of this, you will come up with things that, and I know this, and you don't know me, and we've not established the rapport, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw it at you and say, all right, give me answers, but you can always talk if you want to, um, or your phones can even talk, right? It's all right. Um, you would probably say, well, synonym would be like boss in charge of, commanding officer, leader, right? They wouldn't have said those. To them, kephala meant, head meant protector, provider, the one who helped you thrive and grow. Let me give you an example. In Breton, the education system is completely different. Um, if you uh, want to get a degree, you go find the people that do what you do, and you work a contract through the university, and you take tests all along the way, but the chances are that after your first couple of years of university, you're not going to be sitting in one lecture hall on one campus to get your, your lessons. You're going to be moving about the country. You're going to be reading. You're going to be getting it on your own. And then you have to come and sit the examinations to allow you to go the next year. But you pay all ahead. Uh, you pay for the price of the degree. And it doesn't matter if it takes you two years or 20. It's just get the work done. Well, my wife wanted a master's. We were living over in the south of Scotland at the time. Paid for it. And it wasn't long. Uh, it was just a few months later. I came down and I saw her sitting on the floor with all of her books and papers around her. And she was uh, quietly crying. And I said, what's going on? And she goes, I, I hate this. I thought I was going to love it. But now I'm in it. And I hate it. And I said, Quit. And she looked at me and she goes, I can't quit. You paid all the money. And I said, no, hang about. I paid money so you'd be happy. If you quit and you're happy, I'm good. Well, she being uh, Miss Cammie and very, she plowed through and she got it and, and got her degree, put it in a drawer and went to do something else instead. Uh, and, but that was fine. But the whole point was, no, no, my job is to provide for you and help you Get what you want. What do you need? What's the help here? It is so important we understand that concept. Think of this. How is Christ your head? Does he beat you, yell at you, condemn you, keep you nervous? Are you tense every time Jesus comes home? You get the point? Jesus being head, he is also called our shepherd. You never strike a sheep. You don't do it. You don't yell at sheep. Uh, you have to, uh, you've, I'm sure you've seen it. And they even have some, you've got some old Scottish blood in Kentucky. You might have seen some Scots out there with border collies or Australian shepherds. Any sheepdog that's going to work the sheep has to be multicolored. And the reason is it confuses the sheep. If they're all white, the sheep aren't afraid of them, won't listen to them. If they're all black, they're terrified. But when they're mottled, the sheep are just kind of, I don't know what this is. And so they, they don't actually verbalize that, by the way. Um, but sheep have to be led. They cannot be driven. If you drive sheep, they scatter. They're not cattle. They're very, very different than cattle. God could have said he was a herdsman and we were his cattle. He did not. We are sheep. There's a reason for this. Even in Scotland today, our, our soil is very, very poor very thin. Uh, and because of this, most people have to release their sheep way out on the moors and the mountains. And then you go and get them later. But, every, but other people's sheep are there too. But your sheep will know you if you've imprinted upon them and you've worked with them. They know you. But you don't go out and start driving them around you and get a rope and no, you'll, they will die. They literally will have the strokes. You go out and sing and talk and whistle and they follow you. All right? God has never been the head over us the way we are head over other people when we grab authority in business, uh, in sports, or in, and then in the house. You'll do it my way. What? Even when God said, do it this way, it wasn't to hurt us. It was to make life more pleasant for us. My wife, beautiful, Artistic and the like. At times, 
takes off to go to Colorado or to California or to um, uh, Florida or the like to redo a business or a house. She does both commercial and residential. I've never laid awake at night wondering, all right, my beautiful wife is out there all long way away from me. Who's she looking at and who's she talking? No, 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 no. Why? She is a woman under orders. So am I. No fear. None. We're good. I want, she wants me to prosper. I want her to prosper. That's what the head means. And you cannot move beyond this until you get that in. Next. By the way, that'll come back up when we talk about children later. He is the head of, of the wife as Christ, as. That's, that's the word you want to circle. As. In the same way as. How is Christ the head of the church? Well, his body of which he is the Savior. You save her. You help her. It's... um. Guys, you just you have no idea how much how what it means to your wife if you walk with her spiritually. You pray with her, and when you learn something, you share it with her. And when you read a book, you read them together. It and by the way, the the books my wife picks, almost none of them have I'm just going, oh jeez. That's insight. Because they, they're more devotional, they're more poems, they're more whatever. But I'm going to let her do that sometimes, and then I'm going to do a book sometimes. And the reason is, we do this together. You don't want to move ahead spiritually and leave them behind, and you don't want to be left behind. So we learn together. We move on. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And I'm aware that if you pull that... Out of context, it means some, some pretty hard roads for the women. So let's not pull it out of context. Let's leave it right back in there. And keep watching. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. Just as. That's, the, that's, that's what I want you to circle or underline or make a note of. Just as. Some will say in the exact same way. Just as Christ loved the church. How did he do that? He gave himself up for her. I sleep on a bed now that has a dust ruffle. And I don't know why. All I know is that if our dust needs ruffling, we are equipped. And we can do it. We are equipped for this uh, if that happens. Come along in. We're so glad you, you survived. You know, it's, it's nasty out there, is it not? Um, and if you've not heard me before, I come from the, the Nashville area. That's why I talk like this. Um, I was 10 years in Detroit, and I came down to Knoxville to give a seminar. And after, on the second night, a lady actually came up to me and said that she'd, uh, she was so glad to get to listen. And she'd never heard somebody from Detroit before and didn't know that's how, uh, what the accent was up there. I didn't correct her. Why, you know, let her think Detroit's a magical place. You know, let her go up there. That's all right. Anyway, uh, we're in Ephesians 5. We love our wives just as Christ loved the church. Well, how did he do that? He gave himself up for her. If you read Song of Solomon, and I recommend it, I do. Um, it's, it is erotic poetry. I have people that well, every so often will come up and say, no, it's, a, it's an allegory of Christ's love for the church. No, it isn't. It, it is, it's poetry, and it's highly sexualized. Um, if you find yourself reading it and wonder who put that trash in your Bible then we really need to have a talk. Uh, God created us as sexual beings, and this woman in here is singing the praises of this guy. And she even tells the the other women, "Don't, don't hurry to fall in love. You wait till you get somebody like this guy. And one of the things, there are several, but one of the things he does is he does protect her. The love, the phrase is wonderful. He keeps the little foxes out of the garden, which means he keeps the wee things away from us that would destroy our family. Now, friends, that could be everything from us, from him watching or you watching certain shows to um, certain behaviors. It could be if your mom picks on your wife, you need to have a word with your mom because that's not going to happen. That's just that. That ends. And the same if if your dad picks on the son. My father-in-law, 
is a very tall Texan. Um, I was quite the shock. Uh, and, and he was quite shocked, frankly. You know, I, I wasn't afraid of him and his brothers. I, I look him straight in the belt buckle uh, because, well, you had to. The thing was massive. Anyway, they, they're from Central Texas, and they, and they raise longhorns. I have nothing, and he likes to fly fish. I have nothing in common. None, except for Jesus. We have Jesus, and that's a good thing. He tried to take me fishing a few times. He won't anymore because I always, I, I brought a couple of books and sat down and hoped the fish wouldn't bother me. And he's out there drawing pictures in the sky with string. That's, I don't know if you've seen fly fishermen. I'm not sure how the fish are supposed to get up there. But they're just, he's, he's just, and I was just going. And he even came to Scotland. He came with all this equipment and such. And he said, you know where the good rivers are? And I went, oh, yeah, there's just over there. You know, um, if he, and he doesn't, but if he were to get on my wife saying, that's, that husband of yours doesn't even know how to do this, she would have a word with him. No, 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 no. We protect this. We protect this. But there's another thing that uh, in the Song of Solomon that she praises him for. If she needs ointments or perfumes, he brings it. When I was a bachelor, my, my bathroom counter was a very simple place. You know, there was a razor and a toothbrush and a bit of shampoo. That was kind of it. Now there's a, a city. It's got skyscrapers and flyovers and electronic equipment. And, and I have two doctorates, and I read the back of some of these things, and I'm going, I have no idea what that is. Never heard of it. Probably squeezed it out of an Albanian yak. I don't know. But if, she, if that's what she wants, and she'll, she'll the, a, a wee jar, and she'll say, I'm about out of this. I, at first, I was thrown for a loop once when she said, I'm about out of foundation. I'm going, well, that doesn't sound healthy. You know, what's, what's going on here? Then I realized you know, she was talking about this, and we had to go to the store, and, and, and you had to walk past the perfume Nazis. You know them? You go, Psh, they're spritzing you, and you've got people with asthma dying, you know, all around you. Um, those that made it past Bed Bath & Beyond and Abercrombie, they're dying, and, and she buys it. And I, I could quibble, and I could fight over this, but no, that's part of my job, to make sure she gets what she needs to feel right about herself, and to feel good about herself. Oh, by the way, guys, every so often a guy is tempted to tell her, you don't need all that stuff, you look pretty without it. It doesn't matter. If she feels prettier with it, that's what we do. And I'm, I'm fine with it. Uh, this is, take care of her. Give yourself up for her. The same way, by the way, we're supposed to do for our children. Have you ever noticed that whenever you got, uh, guys, I'm going to talk to the guys, when you've got bet money set aside and new golf clubs or new fishing pole or whatever your, your toy is, um, is, is calling your name, the kid's feet grow. I've had people look at me and say, every time we get some money put aside, the water heater goes out or we need a new roof. And I look at them and say, why don't we just say every time something goes out, you've got a little money put aside. Wouldn't that be nicer? And besides, if you, if you give everything you've got to your kids and working with them and helping them, that, that's a good thing. It's what you're supposed to do. We are under orders. If you remember that below speech at the very first, we are under orders. So give yourself up for them. And then verse 26, to make, now, to make her is what I want you to underline. Uh, we're going to come back to it. To make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself, and here's the big word, as. That's the big church. As a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We're not saying that our mate is blameless and has no stain or wrinkle. But that's how we treat them. Absolutely. My wife um, tells me that she has gray hair. I seriously don't see it. A couple of reasons. One, it's probably not safe to. She's American, so she has a, a, a gun. Um, but um, they're just kind of assigned at birth over here. Um, and that's why I'm really surprised Dr. Spank the babies, because I'm thinking, that kid will pull a knife on you. Uh, anyway, um, that's, uh, 
They're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to move on now. Um, your wife, and, and the second thing is, by the way, when I look at my wife, and, and ladies, here's where you're going to think, I'm just saying something. But you need to realize, not only do I mean what I'm about to say, but so do, the, so do your husbands, and you've doubted them. I still see that teenage girl when I look at my wife. I don't see the intervening years and wrinkles and age and issues. Um, that's why, ladies, he is often just looks at you and kind of grins at you, and you're going, get away from me, you, you, you evil man. I'm just, you know, I'm all dirty and all like. He doesn't see that. He sees you. And he doesn't see what you see. By the way, he doesn't see what you see when you look at him either. Men are hilarious, frankly. Uh, the older we get, the more God takes muscle off of our legs, takes our rear end away, sticks it right up front, rearranges it. We have a wee shelf. Um, he, um, he takes hair off our heads and sticks it in our nose and ears just for the fun of it. Um, he, he does a lot of that kind of thing with us. And then he takes away our eyesight. So we look in the mirror, and every man thinks he's looking pretty good right now. Every man thinks he's about three sit-ups away from a date with a supermodel. So he doesn't, look, he doesn't see himself realistically either. Deal with it. And enjoy it, ladies, because that's the way he looks at you. He looks at you, and, and beyond the... If he doesn't, I need to have a word with him. Because we are to treat our wives as if she were holy, clean, no stain, no wrinkle, and any other blemish. I have um, I've been recorded everywhere for the last 40 years. All my jobs. And I've got three main jobs and then a fourth side job. I work with Fourth Avenue Church uh, downtown Franklin, Tennessee. Uh, one, one, just an amazing group of about a about thousand people um, and, and love them dearly. But I also work for federal and international law enforcement groups. And so uh, as a neuroscientist by training, I still work uh, with them on fear and recovery and the like. And then I also work for a couple of universities, primarily the Ohio State University, to teach one- and two-day courses for the doctors, continuing ed in neuroscience. And I do that two to five times a year. It's according to what track the med schools are on. It gets a bit complex, but they call me when they need me. And I call it drive-by teaching because they don't take a test. They just have to survive the day. Um, instead of just in, you know, two hours, they have to go all day with me. Uh, but in, and again, it's on neuroscience. That's what I, that's what I know. It's what I studied. Uh, and then the other job is I play guitar for people. Everywhere you've heard me and everywhere I'm, I'm recorded, go for it. You will hear me tell many, many jokes about myself, about my nation, your nation, about um, almost anything. You will never hear me say anything that puts my wife in a bad light. Never. Not even teasing. Never. If my wife were to have wrecked the car three times last week, you would never hear about it, ever. If she burned every meal, we had burnt offerings, and you know that's why we've had so much rain and the cattle are fertile, you know, all that, you would have never heard. And by the way, if you're thinking, well, that sounded sexist, it's no, it's realist, because I can't cook. I have tried, and we've all agreed, and the authorities, that we, I should stop. So I, the only thing I make for dinner is a reservation, and, I, um, and we have a cute little thing uh, to us. We're an old married couple, but she makes a meal, but that means I clean up the dishes, clean up the kitchen, put the food away. That's my job. I can do that. And then after that, she goes into a room to play piano. I go upstairs to practice guitar, and then we come together later to go out or do whatever we, we plan to do that night. But the, the point is, if she made errors, if she did this and that, you would never know. Not even if you're my best friend and we're going out fishing for the next two days. I would, and you're thinking, well, what do I talk about now? That'll never come up. Why? My job is to treat her as if there is no error, no wrinkle. And I'm a man under orders, as we talked about. That's what I do. And by the way, you treat people that way, and it's good for you, and it's good for them. 
In the same way, verse 28, and you can underline that, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. That's kind of that leading, you know, if you win an argument with your wife, you lose. Thing. There is no winning. There's, there's, there's a downside. But there's actually a very serious thing here. Verse 29 is where some people try to make it seem like God gives them an out. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. Stop. I've had men say, well, it says no man's ever hated his own body, but I don't like my body. Fair enough. But you do take it to places you like to go, and you do feed it food you enjoy, and you do watch the telly. It is the telly. You guys call it television set, and there's one. One cannot be a set. It's a telly. Um. You, you watch what you want to watch. You, you play the games you like to play. Um, that means that's the way you love her. It doesn't mean that you treat her as far superior to me. No, you're in partnership. You're in this together. And you don't keep score. Now, I, we take this so far as to where, um, well, for example, in a couple of weeks, there's a big bowling thing. Uh, we work trying to create peace between us and the Muslims in, in uh, central Tennessee. And we've been, I've just, we've been having so much fun doing this for the last few years. Uh, and in, here in a few weeks, they said, let's go bowling, and each church is, is sponsoring a lane. I don't bowl. You know, I, it's probably unsafe for me to try. But we're going to sponsor a lane. We're going to go there. But if we did, if my wife and I both bowled, we would bowl on the same team, never against each other. We, don't, we never play against the other. We just determined early in our marriage, you know, let's always be on the same side. I've had people say, when, do you like American football? Yes, I do. I, I like it so much better than our football, where people just run about back and forth for an hour, and then they go, oh, nil, nil, that was a great game, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. You know, uh, the, uh, we, we, need, we need scoring is what we need. And not penalty kicks, that's silly. If that's the way to settle the game, do that and we'll go home early. But I love American football. So people say, who do you root for? I root for the Denver Broncos. Why? Because my wife's from Denver. And I'm not going to upset her. You know, go whoever you are out there. I'm not a real big fan. I just like to watch it. Again, we are all members of his body. And look verse for this, verse uh, 31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now, a lot of people think the two shall become one flesh is a sexual thing. No, not really. Um, nothing wrong with that if there was, but that's not really what he's going for. If you, um, if you get a Louisville paper on Sunday, they probably still do this. Um, I mean, it has to be a bigger city, so Cincinnati or Louisville. There should be a page in there somewhere about wedding announcements. Right, and you'll see it's almost always a woman as if she's um, getting married alone, you know. But there she is, and then a wee corner off to here somewhere, there'll be the people are you know fifty, sixty, seventy year married. Take a look, go back and forth. Notice that the ones who've been married for a long time kind of look like each other. My my wife first noticed that she cried for a week, but that's not the point. The point. The point is. How, why are they one flesh? Because they worked with each other. They went through the same experiences. They didn't live in the same house as strangers. Now, we have more than one telly in our house, and that's, that's wonderful. So I can watch stuff when she's watching her skating or, or the like. Yes, absolutely. But we're not living separate lives. There's a certain amount of time that we'll be away from each other. And it's not like we have to watch each other. It is... We are, we are a team. What can we do together? How can we help? Uh, how can I help you thrive or you help me thrive? How, what can we do today to make this a, a joy? And again, we are very, very different. I have, um, um, I'm eccentric. I know that I am. I don't mean to be. It was just, you know, it happened. It's my spiritual gift, I guess. I can sit and read for eight and nine hours and not be aware time has passed. 
My wife says I'm the only human being in imminent danger of being overrun by a glacier because I won't even notice it. You know, I just think, oh, my, my right side's a bit numb, but that's all right. She doesn't ridicule me because she knows that I use the knowledge I have to protect our family, feed our family, support mission work, uh, take care of the poor. She knows that's how I, I generate. You know, I'm paid for knowledge, you know, and, and so I get knowledge. My wife can't sit still. I keep saying, I could teach you. I can teach you how to sit still. But she's just moving around. Most of my pictures of her are blurry, you know, because she's just, she's always, but I don't say, yeah, would you just settle down? No, that's what she needs. It's who she is. Let her. We don't attack the other one for not being like us. That's important. Now, now that we've said that, what about the ladies? Well, there aren't, there, there's not a chapter which is a, a rough equivalent here. No, no, not the last chapter of Proverbs. Let me talk to you about the last chapter of Proverbs. Number one, that wasn't even Solomon wrote that. You notice that, right? It's another guy. It says, this, this, not, I'm, out, I'm out, this is him, about his mom. And it's a, it's a guy writing about his mother. When we write about our mothers, we remember all the good things, right? Proverbs 31 has been used to beat up on women. I don't know how many women's days a church will put on and they'll do that. And I'm going, no! Nobody can do all of this in one day unless they're on meth. And then they can only do it for a bit. Right? No. This is a woman's life he's talking about. He's compressing her life and all of her goodness and talking about his mom. And he's, so, so where are we going to go for women? I will grant you it's not an exact equivalent, but we're going to go to Titus chapter 2. Because Titus chapter 2, nobody gets out of a life. It's kind of like the book of James. The book of James is a cosmic dentist. You know you need to go, but it's going to hurt. Right? Titus 2 is like that as well. If any of you are a dentist out there and you were offended, don't be, because you know it's true. Um, he talks about older men, younger women. Uh, rather, younger men. Older women, younger women. Um, the best one, I'm going, I'm going to go here, verse 3, uh, chapter 2, Titus. Uh, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Now, in case you're thinking, well, that was a very harsh thing to say. You have to look at the context. Titus is in Crete, and Crete was a mess. He'll even say, you know, you've heard people say that everybody in Cretan are gluttons and lazy, and that's true. And I'm going, Paul, you're not allowed to say that, but evidently he was. So it's a mess of a place. But it is true that women tend to like stories. And so they watch programs that have stories in them. Uh, Hallmark movies every Christmas. You know, I'm going, no, because we all know, you know, she's going to come home. She was successful. She has a great fiancé, but now she meets a bad boy. She forgot at home, and there's a dog. And that's it. I, that, that's the movie. But my, my wife has read Mae Benchy novels. Now, if you don't know who she is, that's fine. Nothing has ever happened in a Mae Benchy novel, ever. Some people talk, and then they stop. You know, I, I, men really want there to be somebody has to die uh, and, and blowing up would be helpful um, a chase scene or whatever and not chasing them to talk to them either we we are very very different i was on the plane a few years ago and uh, a lady across the, the the aisle from me pulled up a big stack of magazines and they were all like us and people and that sort of thing right and she wasn't reading them she was studying. Now, it is possible, actually, that she was trying to do a master's degree in that kind of literature. Because, I mean, that's how she was in it. And fi finally, she pulled out one, which I didn't know existed since then. I've seen it several times. Soap Opera Digest. I want you to think about this for a minute. She's reading gossip about people who don't exist. Okay, 
Paul says, don't get into the silliness of these things. But he's got things to say about men. We already, we already saw that. Instead, move on. They can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled. Do you notice that? It doesn't say to be under the husband's absolute authority. No. Come on, ladies. Control yourself. Remember, I started this, a man under orders. Women are under orders as well. Those of you that came in a bit late, and I understand that because, you know, traffic and weather and the like. I talked about my father is dying, and he is in a dementia care unit. My father was abusive to us growing up. I had two sisters I lost to suicide. And people ask me, how do you go down every week? It's a, it's a two-hour drive one way, a two-and-a-half-hour to go and, and you know, talk to him and, and take care of him, bathe him. I'll, I'll, I'll change his diaper. And they'll say, how, do you, what, how can you do that? And my answer is, uh, it, it doesn't matter if he doesn't do his job. I have to do mine. Period. Which, by the way, is why I was appalled, and I won't say his name, by a certain TV preacher who a few years ago said that if your wife had Alzheimer's uh, and she lingered for like eight or nine years, that it, it would be all right for you to go ahead and have a girlfriend. He really did. And I'm going, what? what, what? No, no. You have a job. And that doesn't matter what happens to her. You have a job. And that goes, you know, I'm, I'm really digging this into my grandson so that they'll pick out a better nursing home for me. But let's take a look at verse 4. Because, let, and, and I'm not a Greek uh, expert by any stretch of the imagination. But I know Greek experts. That's the thing. You can't know everything. Uh, and if you are thinking, oh, neuro, you know, neuroscientist, Patrick's a neuroscientist, I need to talk to him about this nerve going down my arm. Nope. Nope. If it's outside the brain bucket, nope. <laughs> but I know other people. I can ask them. So you, all right, we all got that. In Greek, this, this passage says, teach them to be children lovers and men lovers. I there's the rub. We live in a society that wants men and women to hate each other. So in the commercials, there's always conflict, and usually the guy's the idiot. And that's been true all my life. That's, that's nothing new. Um, Christine Summers wrote a book many years ago called The War Against Boys. And, it, and it's a serious war. I don't mean, I don't want to ever step outside my boundaries here and upset anybody. By the way, I know I've gone on a bit. My idea is if we do, you can anytime get up and there are snacks in there, right? And you can avail yourself of that. Um, don't be shy. I teach in universities. They do everything. And I almost said, but order pizza. There was one that did. And, and I've, I thought it was fantastic. I, I had no problem with that at all. All right, so you're free. There are drinks and snacks back there. If I give a break, well, I can give you a break, or I can just keep talking, and we could end early so you could get away from the ice and snow. I mean, it's up to you. I'm, I open a refrigerator, the light comes on, I do 15 minutes, so I have no problem talking. Um, well, I'm, I'm, think about it, and I'll ask you again in about 5 or 10. All right? Okay. Women... You are told what's wrong with men. But let's talk about men for a bit. Uh, I don't do counseling because um, that's not what I do. I, I, you know, I work with broken men mainly. Um, there are some that are women, but military and like PTSD and like. But I don't have a counseling office. I did for nine years, and that was enough. Um, I, I wanted to move on and do something else. When I did the counseling office, the number one complaint of young women uh, who were newly married, and we put it very arbitrary, first three years of marriage is where we put it, was he only thinks about one thing and he can't keep his hands off me. Number one complaint to women married over 20 years, he won't touch me, doesn't talk to me. Yeah, because even a cow learns if you hit that electric fence a few times, don't touch it. And women were treating the man as if he was wrong to physically desire them. And here's the truth. I see them every day, and I, I, I watch their faces, I watch their demeanor. Men are so hurt and lonely 
and they'll never tell you. They thought you would be as crazy about them as they are about you. And it turned out not to be the case. In fact, even as a woman is marrying the man, which is a weird thing we do, it really is. All the men look the same. They're even wearing the same clothes. The woman brings her best friends and puts them in clothing which is hideous. No man will ever desire anybody having to wear these maids' dresses. You know, he always says, you can wear it again. Really? The circus coming? And yet she comes down beautiful, you know, beautiful starlight, little angels and cupids all around her. The man looks at her thinking, this is the woman of my dreams. This is the person I want to live with forever. I cannot wait. The woman looks at the man, really, but I think, I think I can do something with him. And it's a whole different clash right there. And when a man realizes this, it breaks his heart. And that's why men go quiet, go absent, or go into the garage, garage, for those of you that want to say it in a French way. Um, people that speak English call it a garage. Anyway, and, and work all the time and not talk to you. Now, if he has a hobby, understood. He has a hobby. But if he's avoiding, it's because it didn't go well inside. It just didn't go well inside. And that's sad. It really is. But also women don't understand how much a man needs a woman. That's because we don't know our scripture. The woman was created after man. I think it was because, and, and but the passage really bothered me when I was a boy, that they, you know, they bring the animals to, to Adam to see what he'll call them, and then he goes, I can't find a mate here, and I'm thinking, shouldn't have God known that? Well, yeah, but Adam didn't figure that out. Then he produces the woman, and he makes her as a helper fit for him. And so there are some women that get very upset about this. And they'll say, oh, we're just the helper. Oh, you don't understand the concept of helper in Scripture. That name is reserved, the rest of the Old Testament, for God. The rest of the Old Testament, when you find that word, it refers to God. I look to the eyes from whence comes my help. Same root word. She was created second because we needed her. And I will be very upfront. We need women more than they need us. Period. We do. That's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of, of, of observation. In fact, if, um, uh, if a couple ever gets talking about, well, if I die, will you remarry? The woman will generally say, no, I don't want to train another one. You know, that's that st standard line that they do. Well, the fact is, the guy probably will if he can catch somebody. You know, at, the, at, the, at, at your funeral, he may be looking for the, you know, the people that look good in black. You know, you know saying, um, it's, it's not that you're disposable or replaceable. It's because he knows he needs. And this is, isn't just sex here. This is, he needs someone to help him be okay. I do stuff all the time where people will stand up and applaud and the like. Um, I got to play the symphony behind an amazing center, uh, singer about a year and a half ago now, uh, Misha, and it was just me playing a, a variety of different guitars and stringed instruments and a guy playing uh, the big djembe, which is a, a tall African-style drum, and a singer. Just three of us, we played the symphony all night. That was, that was amazing. I never thought I'd get to do something like that. I usually play parks and small rooms. Um, that said, at the end of the night, there was only one person's opinion I cared about. I asked my wife, is it okay? Her opinion matters. And whenever I give a talk or a sermon or, or whatever, you know, people can go out and say it was the best sermon, it was the worst sermon. It doesn't matter. It's what she thinks. That's what matters. And if, you, ladies, if you're thinking, well, that's not my husband, let me ask you about this. Well, let's say it's hot outside. That's 90 degrees, but tomorrow it's supposed to be 80. And he's out there mowing the lawn. And you're thinking, you idiot. Why don't you wait till tomorrow? And the answer is, it's more impressive if I do it today. That's why we'll play basketball when we shouldn't. When we should be leaving that to the, the younger men. We'll do that. That's why we don't fix the screen door if you still have screen doors. Why? That's not impressive. But if we hear a little noise, 
we will tear the transmission out of your car because that's impressive. Men will die to their dying day are trying to impress you. If we wash a dish, we will show it to you. This is, this is why it is so important that if your husband's trying to help and you go, you're making a mess and you push past him, congratulations. You've just killed part of him. Only you can make him thrive. Period. Uh, men, are, men are wired for win or lose in competition. That's, it's, it's who we are. If you don't believe me, go to a bookstore. There are still bookstores on the planet. Uh, or even just go to a Kroger or the like, to the magazine rack. And which magazines are for the men? And you can spot them immediately. Biggest gun, fastest boat, more fish, whatever it is. It, you're winning. They're winners and losers. The women's, it's all community. 28 crafts, your family will flip over. 18 recipes, they'll have them asking for more. It's all community. Now, is that stereotypical? Is it a bit sexist? Yes, it is, but that's what you will see when you take a look at them. Even our movies are, as I said, different. And the movies men like, winners and losers. I have an English friend, you know, and I'm a Scotsman, and... and both of us, one of our favorite movies is Braveheart. I like the first bit. He likes the last 20 minutes. Because we lose rather horribly. But there are winners and losers. Why do men watch the news so much? Why do they watch the weather so much? Winners and losers. When I first saw this band of snow coming across, my first thought was, missing us. No, well, we're going to be good in Franklin. You know, Nashville will be, be, be happy tonight. Winners and losers, and because of this, they go through life feeling when, that they've won or lost a dozen times during a day. That's why they don't tell you about it. They come home, you say, how was the day? And they'll go, it's pretty good. And they're done. My wife knows that I don't get this, but she will still tell me everything she did in the design world that day. I've never gotten a picture in my head. None. She gets it, but, I, but she can't help it. She needs to share it because we're a team. And I'll stand there and listen because we're a team. It's my gift to her. Every, I remember once she wanted something. I, I, I assume our windows were, were sick because they needed treatments. And she, she wanted to send me to Lowe's to get this thing that she had not gotten. And uh, she even drew it. And, uh, and I went, all right, yeah, fair enough. And she goes, no, if the salesman doesn't know what you're talking about, see that it's kind of a flounce. I went, I'm, I'm not going to use the word flounce. We, we need an alternative word. <laughs> and so she worked on that. Um, and, I, and sometimes I do feel like I'm going in there saying, my mommy sent me for this. <laughs> but I'm all right. I'm all right with that because I enjoy being married to her. She will come in if she goes to Target. She'll set the things down. And I'm, I'm just waiting. It's going to happen. How was it? Well, and now she will tell me every bargain she got. Now, it was marked to this, but I had a coupon. Then I had the red card over there. And then there was this thing that if you did this, this, and this, and the other, and you got. And I know what she's doing is she's trying to tell me, again, Proverbs 31, that she's a worthy woman that has brought value to the marriage, and she has. But why don't men talk? Ladies, they don't talk because they love you. When we talk, all, all we use communication for is competition and rank. We, we don't really want to do that with you. Um, because of that, we, um, we struggle to find things to say. It, and we don't, it, it's not a natural thing for us. We have to learn how to listen and respond. And I would submit to you to be men lovers, you need to understand that. I need to understand that we sometimes, my wife knows sometimes I need to go quiet. Um, I am not a sworn law officer. Even as I'm flying into all these places, I have a handful of badges. Be um, I don't know if you know this or not. Whenever you've helped a military person or a person in law enforcement to a certain extent, they come and it's a mark of respect. They hand you their badge. And I've got bags of them in, in my safe. 
And um, I was in Texas recently, and two Texas Rangers handed me their badge. I'm going, dude, you know, I always wanted to be a cowboy, but nobody's ever going to believe this if I put this on. So it's going in the safe for the grinds. I listen to these men, and they go through their experience, and they're so, it's so hard for them to even talk about. And it's things such as there's a car wreck, and they're picking up bits of the baby, and they're struggling. I know when they go home and their wife says, how was it? They'll just say, we just had a really bad wreck. And the wife wants to help you by helping you talk. Ladies, it doesn't help us to talk. And that's, here's a big struggle. Let's, here's, here's an illustration. You need to know this. Um, what if we had a child that was um, special needs or difficult or something, and no matter what we've done, we've never been able to fix it or get things better at all. Sometimes the woman will start talking about it, and the man will say something like, we talked about this before. And everybody's hurt. All right, guys, what you need to know is she needs to talk about it. Ladies, what you need to know is that he can't. So... Let the man sit there and listen to you talk. And guys, this is very important. Try very hard not to offer a solution. That's big. And my wife will be walking through the house, and she'll have a look on her face, and I'm going, do you have a headache? Because pain, that's something we look for in neuroscience. And she's going, yeah, I do. Like, she's surprised. I go, wow. Um, you take a couple of aspirin for that. She goes, yeah, I'll do that. Hour or two later, she's walking through that face on. I'm going, do you take the aspirin? And she'll stop and she'll go, I forgot. How? Because when men do something, that's what they're doing. This is why when a man gets a cold, it's always fatal. It is. We're laying on the couch. I'm dying. Uh, now, I'm, I'm one of those guys that if I get sick, I don't want anybody to talk to me, bring me anything. I just want to crawl in a cave. If I come out, I'm well. But I, I have friends that are, I need soup or whatever. I'm going, you know, you need smotherings, what you need. Yeah, that's it. Uh, anyway, women will have a cold, and they'll pack the kids' lunches, and they're taking care of this. And, sh- and, and why? They can multitask. Men are designed point action. Um, if you don't know what point action, see the bear, kill the bear. They are designed for this. So let's do a clash. All right, by the way, I, I didn't stop in 10 minutes, did I? I'm going to just keep going if you want me to. Coffee, yeah. No, I'm good. I'm good. All right, or you can hang about after if you wish, all right? Uh, so, all right? Uh, he doesn't care if you stay here hours. Hours. Anyway, I'm. <laughs> Uh, here's a clash of systems, right? You're laying in the bed uh, at night, asleep. The woman wakes up first because she hears a noise. She will lay there for a certain amount of time. Actually, it's measurable. Women have a certain amount of noise listening time before she attempts to rouse the husband. Now, the reason I say it attempts is because the husband is now sleeping. He's not noise listening, so he's focused. Once you get him up to a certain level of consciousness, he'll go, what? And the wife will say, there's a noise. And he will say, no, there isn't. Because he's sleeping. And he just then has to assume you would only wake him up to lie to him to get him off of I'm sleeping. So finally, he hears the noise. And he leaps from the bed. And he reaches down, grabs a Louisville slugger. And he's walking down the hallway in the BVDs. And... and and the wife will go, what, what are you doing? Get back in here. And he's completely lost now. He was comfortable sleeping. You're the one who told him there's a noise. We are threatened. The Mongols are storming the drawbridge. So he's going to go kill it. Now, she, guys, I, I cannot help you with this except to say this. She doesn't want you to go kill it. She may be afraid that your killing skills are not up to it. But that's not really it. The reason she woke you up was so that you could discuss it. 
and what it might mean. Because women are concerned about security. Security is very important to a woman. One of the reasons is because women can get pregnant and have children. You know, there's, I mean, let's, not be, let's not act like that's not huge. It's huge. They need protection, security. They need to know tomorrow's okay. Men, focus. And so we'll, again, run out to play basketball. Or, you know, one of my grands, I have a nine-year-old grandson who's a phenom. He's, he's just, his basketball skills are off the chart. And every so often, he'll say, let's play, Granda. And I'm going, or, or not. <laughs> but every so often, I'll get in, the, and I'll start playing with him, and then I'll hop in a car, and my wife goes, well, that was fun. I'm going, Advil. <laughs> Lots of Advil. <laughs> By Procter & Johnson. It's going to go up. I should have thought about it. And women will sometimes say, why didn't you think about that? Because we were focused on the one thing. All right? They're watching. Let's say your, your guy likes football and you don't. I've been in marriage. I've seen marriages where it was, but let's just say. And I've had women that will say, well, I wait and talk to him to talk to him during the commercial. Uh, rather, I, talk, I try to talk to him and he won't talk to me. And the guy will say something like, well, we had, you could wait and talk to me during the commercials. Women get hurt. They don't know why they're hurt, really. They make up reasons. Here's why. The reason they want to talk to you when you're watching football or whatever you're focused on is because they've lost that connection. They're all about connection and security. The reason they don't talk to you during the commercial is you're available. One of my favorite cartoons was, it's, it's, this thing's going to be 40 years old now. A man is sitting at the breakfast table with his wife, and he has the newspaper held off over to the side, and he goes, before I begin, was there anything you wanted to discuss? I love that cartoon. Because the answer, although it's a one-panel cartoon, the answer would be no, until you start reading. Why? Because right now we're connected. We're not. And the discussion will, will ensue. Once we understand that we're built this way, I think it helps us to actually talk and find humor in it. I want to talk to you for a second about the why there as well. People say, well, then why did God do it this way? Oh, the half has never yet been told. Man's sexual prime, 17 to 25. Ah, don't look at me, guys. It's over. You're done. Woman's sexual prime, way more elastic, way more complicated but generally starts somewhere in late 30s or in the 40s, sometimes even later, and goes for a long time. Why would... Well, we're not done yet. Man's sexual response is very different than a woman's sexual response. Men are microwaves. Women are crockpots. Not instant pots, but crockpots. Um, why would God do... And my response is, I, the only thing I can think of is that God intended for us to negotiate all of our lives. He intended for us to talk, negotiate, give, and sacrifice all of our lives. To learn what it's like to be God. Because God's not striding around heaven saying, I'm in charge up here. God is giving. He is sacrificing. I would hate to be God. Most of the people he loves will never love him back. Most people he gives stuff to, takes the stuff he gives them, and uses it on other lovers, the world, the flesh, the devil. Wow. And yet, upon the righteous and the sinner, he sends sunshine and rain. He gives the blessings. And he says, now go do that. You be that to these people. Um, yeah. We are a, a, a very interesting mix Tell you what, you're being a bit shy. I'm going to give you seven minutes. We're going to come back. I'm going by that wee clock back there because I'm sure that's linked into Greenwich Mean Time. At 7 uh, yeah, 725, let's come back and do like a 10, 15-minute wrap-up, okay? But just get up and stretch a bit because you're, you're in these chairs. Move a bit. Head can only absorb what the, feet, uh, the uh, seat can endure.
we can use for, for both men and women, uh, and that is how can we find a way to make these roles work? Nehemiah is the guy I like to go to for the mail, and I'm going to do this quickly. But I, I want you, sadly, the only time we go to Nehemiah in most churches is when you want to start a building program. Yeah, and that's not what he was about. Uh, Nehemiah was a, a model of a man. But I also think a lot of what he did is transferable to women. So let's, let's do that quickly. Here was a man in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, verses 3 and 4. He was concerned about the things of God. Now, that's really hard for a guy. It is. We, we tend to get concerned about our thing. Ministers are the worst. They start trying, you know, they're concerned about how they're going to run the church and how they were received and how their lesson went. Ministers are not immune from this by any stretch of imagination. Instead, Nehemiah had a good job and had no obligation to the people of Jerusalem. But in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, his heart was broken by the things that broke the heart of God. And so, in chapter 2, he is asked by the king, what's, what's the problem? And he does not respond until he prays. Chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. I have no idea if this is still going on or not. Um, but years and years ago, I talked to a bunch of Navy personnel, United States Navy personnel in Norfolk, Virginia. This is back in the late 80s when we first came uh, across and there were uh, a couple of the men had been enlisted, and then they'd gone before a panel and were chosen for officer candidate school or officer training school, whichever it is in the Navy. And um, I, I talked to him. I said, what was the hardest part about that? And I had all kinds of answers in my head already. It wasn't what they told me. They said they walked in before a board. I don't know how many people are on the board. don't know if that matters. The hardest thing, and they, they ask him questions, but the hardest thing was they said, every question we ask you, you must wait a full 60 seconds before you respond. There was a big clock behind him. They said, if you answer before, you will receive one warning. Second time, you're done. What is your name? And as soon as you said it, where are you from? Or how do you spell that? And they were trying to trip them up. And I asked the guys, I said, that's really weird. What, what's the point of that? They said, they told us afterwards that the reason is they do not want an officer that speaks before they think. They wanted us to get in the habit already of thinking. That's what I think of when I see Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. The king said, why are you so downcast? What is troubling you? And before he answered, he prayed. He prayed before he answered. That this humbles me somewhat because I can be pretty quick on the answer and pretty slow on the prayer. And so Nehemiah is one of those that just kind of drags me behind the car for a bit and says, Patrick, shape up. He also, gentlemen, remember I told you, women are concerned about their security. In chapter 4, and if you're writing this down, We'll, we'll narrow this. Chapter 4, verses 7 through 23. And then go to chapter 7, um, just the first few verses. He took precautions to protect the people. Now, this is where you might get uncomfortable in some places. If I was in, oh, Berkeley, California right now, I'd be thinking, all right, I have to get these people ready for what I'm about to see. I'm in Kentucky. I think I can do this. He armed and set a guard to protect the people. And when that wasn't enough, he made it a law that you had to have a weapon. The only time you could not have a weapon on you is if you're going to the toilet. And you don't really get that in Nehemiah because the translators do everything they can not to say going to the toilet. And so um, it's what it meant. You're, uh, you're to have a weapon on you to protect yourself and protect your family. My, I asked my wife what she wanted for Christmas, and she wanted a simply safe security system. And I looked at her and I said, why? And she said, because you're gone a lot, and I'm getting older. And I, was just, and I said, okay. By the way, it wasn't simple to install, because it was me doing it. 
we, we almost, satellites were falling out of orbit. It was awful by the time we got done, but we got it done. The other day, I opened up the front door to get something. Right, beep, 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 beep. And I'm looking over her, and she's going, uh, that's the alarm. I go, I, I know. I just don't know what to do now. And are you going to shoot me, or will someone else come do that for us? And, and, and but we, I, I, I make sure that I take care. Why? Because that's her security. Okay, that's fine. Um, and I kid about firearms. I'm actually quite good at them because I have to hang around cops a lot. But I've also I've lived in places where you couldn't have them, and those weren't safe places. So, um, and I feel for the people in Aurora, Illinois today. There was a shooter there. Um, but he took precautions. Now, just when you think God's a good uh, Republican, uh, in chapter 5, he moves against social injustice. He brings all the rich people in because he talked to the poor people saying, you're not working really hard and you keep running off back home. What's wrong? Well, they had to raise money to pay for their debts. And the interest was too high. So he calls all the rich people in, and he says, you're canceling the debts. And they said, okay. And I've had people before say, why did they say okay? Chapter 4, he armed the people. And then you talk to the rich folk and say, the debts are gone now, and you're not doing this anymore. So I mean, that, God's not left or right. God is just. And sometimes that's going to look left or right. All right? And so he also, I love this. In chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, he never took a salary. He paid for all of his own stuff and paid for all of his men's food and accommodations and such. Never took a penny from the people. Uh, it's hard to remember now, but just over 200 years ago, your people and my people had a bit of a dust-up, a disagreement. It was a small thing. And one of the things is you didn't want a royalty. But you got one. Because your senators and congressmen don't have to follow the laws you do. They don't have to have Social Security. They don't have to have Obamacare. They don't have to do... And, and, wasn't, and I don't want to just say Obama. This is left, right, and center people. They have, they have excused themselves from all of these rules. And whenever they walk around, they walk around with a, a big armed guard that you pay for. Some of them, I know some of the Congress people, if I named them, it would seem to be too political, that run up over $1,000 a week, liquor bills, and you pay them. They can go places you can't go. They have security you will never have. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just appalled. I'll look and I'll go, you, you shot us because we taxed your breakfast beverage. What happened to you? And over the last election a couple of years ago, everybody was so upset. Everyone, I would just go, you know, I've lived through 12 presidents, one queen. If you want to come back, I'll have a word, you know. Um, but it's, it's amazing. We, I remember when George Bush did not fly over Katrina soon enough. He was criticized. And, and of course, those that do fly over, and they, they lean over and they frown at the water. And we're going, oh, they care. And every Thanksgiving, it'll be, you know, the Bushes did it, Obama did it, Clintons do it. Oh, they all do it. They'll run in and they'll serve meals in a homeless place for 10 minutes. Get pictures. And then they'll all run to the hospital, Walter Reed, and get pictures. Nehemiah didn't do any of that. That's why I love him. He wasn't a Republican or Democrat or Libertarian, nothing. He was just a man of God. He was not going to take anything from the people. He was going to serve the people. And he did. To his own hurt, he served the people. And then uh, John Wayne shows up in chapter 6. Verses 2 to 4, but then 11 through 13 is the brilliant bit. There were some people that decided to put out a hit on him to kill him. So other people came to him and said, they're coming, they're going to kill you. You'd better get away. And Nehemiah uses this phrase. I want it to on my business cards one day. He says, will a man like me run? Oh, I like that one. I do. I have friends that run for fun. I don't get that at all. We'll put little things on our back, 26.1, you know. My favorite one, I saw one up the other day, is 28.3, and underneath it says, I got lost. Oh, I loved that one. That was brilliant. 
Uh, the only marathon I've ever done was a Mythbusters marathon, and it was pretty easy. I just you know, had to get snacks. Uh, but I don't run, and I find it just hilarious that Nehemiah goes, well, a man like me run. In other words, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. This is what a man is supposed to be. Take care of the people. What if I die without a lot of my stuff and my dreams and my this and my that because I took care of Kami and our kids? That's a pretty good deal. I'll take that. I, um, I want to live in such a way that you know, they're sad when I'm gone. So let's be, you know, in, right now I'm spoiling my grandkids as fast as I can. Because they'll probably pick my nursing home. But also because grandparents and grandkids get along so well because they have a common enemy. And, uh, and so we're, we're doing our best here. Isaiah, uh, if you want another definition of a man, Isaiah 32, verse 2. He is a, uh, he is a spring of water in a desert. He is a shelter from the storm. That's my job. When I, uh, let, me, let me do this and do this, right? If, um, ladies, if you're thinking, you know, I've been trained, to, and you know, I walk in and his, his socks are on the floor. If you send him in to look for him, he won't see him. And the reason is, they're not dangerous. We are, we are designed to see danger. We just, we don't see, you could say, well, if he doesn't see him, I'll kill him. That could help. That could do it. Um, we are, we're designed to see different things. Gentlemen, with all of that said, I want, to, I want you to train yourself to see when you are adding to her burden and stop it. When I get home tomorrow, um, one of the first things I will do uh, is get my hug from a girl, and she's still my girl after 39 years. But then I will bring in my gear, and I'm not saying you have to do this. As, a, as my way to show her I appreciate the way she does without me so much so I can go help others. I do my laundry. I do my ironing. I put away, I unpack and put everything away, get all the mess taken care of before I'll sit down and eat or do anything else. And the reason is, that's the way I can show her I see what you go through. I don't want to cause you more problem. I want to be able to take something off of the problem and so uh, several times a day, I'll say, is, is there anything I can do for you? And most of the time, the answer is no, frankly. But if there is, I don't always go, yes, because a lot of times it's like, oh, rats, there is. But then you do it. Let her help you see. Ladies, a husband is to be a warrior, a lover, and a monk. And I normally spend a day doing this with men, but warrior to fight for those that need a warrior. That does not always mean with guns and fists. It can be with a pencil, and you are helping them sort out their finances and get out from debt. It could be, uh, it could be with making a new law to protect people. You know, there's so many ways to be a warrior. And so don't make it all about you know, uh, swords and guns. Lover, we are, we are supposed to be the ones who see those who are crying and refuse to walk past them. I'm in, I'm in airports a lot, and men shame themselves by the way they treat young mothers that are trying to get through security, trying to get on an airplane, and they got gear, and they got babies, and the TSA people are right there, and the men are going, <sighs> and said, really? Well, you're not a man then. I've got no use for you. Go back and help the lady. If they, you will see they come on, and they got the kids... The men will always look away. Don't, don't make eye contact. They'll sit by here. Sometimes I'll just smile and say, I'm a granddad. If you need help, have a seat. And, you know, one out of 20 think I'm a perv and move on, but the rest of them will take care. You know, and somebody's a bad judge of character. I just don't know who it is. But in, um, and then monk. You need to learn how to walk alone with God. Gentlemen, uh, my, I, I talked to you a bit about my father at the very beginning. My father did teach me something very, very important for which I will always thank him. He taught me how to stand alone. 
I can stand alone. The world can all vote this way or all do this, that, or I can stand right here. And I can go quiet and be by myself and God, just warrior, lover, monk. And ladies, we'll talk a wee bit more about your role tomorrow, but I will just say once again, being a helper is not secondary in God's economy. It is equal to God. He is our helper, and he made you to be the helper for man because there's not a man on the planet can do anything worthwhile without a woman that he loves and trusts to help him do it. And I'm, That might be an overstatement, but I'm just going to say in my experience, that's what I see. Women are incredible. And that's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 8 through 12, that it says that man was not made for woman, but woman for man I'll, I'll, I'll use this as a, as a taster, teaser, and then um, we'll, we'll move on to the close for the night. Every so often, I'm asked to do singles retreats, and I don't get it. I just don't, because I've been married since Noah was in dry dock. So I'm going, all right. And I don't know if you've ever been to one, but if you, if you haven't, don't, don't think that it's all about a whole bunch of uh, young people looking to find a mate. It's almost entirely uh, middle-aged and up people who are divorced or widowed or never married. There's no way to say this without hurting somebody's feelings, but here we go. When you see the women that have never been married, they're, they're really good. They're, they have great manners. They dress well. The makeup's great. Uh, they, they know how to converse on many subjects. You're thinking, these people are delightful individuals. You see the men that have never been married? Oh, my goodness. They are a mess. The manners are atrocious. They don't know how to behave. Their clothes are off. It's just something's wrong with them. And the reason is, we need you more than you need us. I mean, that's just a fact. It's in First Corinthians. Therefore, acknowledge that you need each other for different things. I mean, we lived on top of a mountain in West Virginia for nine years when I worked with West Virginia University. Loved the people there. Absolutely dead. But and you're on a mountain in West Virginia, and every so often there'd be bears. And, and so we had a neighbor worked with the uh, DNR, and they'd just call us and say, get your dogs in. A bear's been spotted in your area. And I'd love to tell you a better story, but I've never, I never saw a bear. And, and they might have been right next to me, but I, hunters see things that non-hunters don't. And, and we don't hunt in Breton. Well, the only people who can hunt in Scotland are very rich English people named Nigel. The re- we're, we're not allowed to own guns or hunt. So our job is to hold the deer, basically. You know, I said, right, go ahead, you know. Uh, and, and then they'll shoot, and we'll go, oh, they got Hamish. But anyway... Um, I never saw a bear. But one day, my son at that time, he wasn't a big Marine like he is now. He's a little guy. And he came in to me. He said, Da, there's a big bear out in the front yard. Or, no, he said, there's a big mean dog out in the front yard. My first thought was, that could be a bear. So I went out and looked. And no, it was a big mean dog. And it was obviously mad. It was, the head was doing this and the slobber. And it was growling. And not, all right, son. Um, I'm going to go out and take care of this. And... There's no way to take care of it but to shoot it. And so um, I'm starting to go to the door, and he grabbed my trousers. Now, these are trousers, not pants. Pants go under trousers. Uh, anyway, um, so I have so many stories. of. Anyway, anyway, he grabbed on. He goes, Dad, but you might get hurt. And I said, uh, son, you need to know this now. This is the only reason they keep us around um, to do this. And if something happens to me, it's your job. Come get me. You know, so... I wonder why he grew up to be a tough Marine. Anyway, um, the point being, yeah, we are useful to you ladies. We will go to war for you every day. Going to work is going to war for us. It's competition. And we could be working in the same office with you. You're in community. You're helping uh, get your security up. And the guy is at war. And you don't know the difference because you don't live in our head. Winners and losers, rank and the like. Um, ladies, we need your help. Understand that that's a good thing and a sign of your high status, not secondary. Now, I need to put, bring this down 
because we normally I do this, it takes a lot more time than we're doing it this weekend, but we didn't give you much of a break, and uh, I need you to get home before it gets too nasty out of the way. Um, somebody asked me how long it would take to get to my hotel, and I said, 20 minutes, unless I hit ice, and then less. Um, but uh, Justin has a prayer to offer, and we'll let that also be our, our, our ending. All right? Thank you. Do, do you need this? Are you properly equipped? You're good. All right. So thank you. Cheers.